Winter is coming, folks, and cold and snow is in the forecast. Winter storm watches are up, and I'll show you just who's most likely to see the white stuff. Severe weather is also in the forecast, and we're watching a few areas out in the tropics for potential development over the coming days, all while being in day five of solar storm conditions. Got all the details coming right up. We're going to start here with our tropical update. Hello there, friends, and welcome into the channel. My name's Jason. I'm so glad you're here to track the weather with me on this Friday, October the 3rd. We're on the doorstep of another weekend. We made it, and we're going to start here with the tropical update. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button down below and join the team. Give us a like by hitting the thumbs up button and ring the bell to turn those notifications on. Let me know if there's anything I or the community can be in prayer about. Put that in the comment section. If you have a question, I read and respond to all of those comments also, so just type it in. But we're going to start here on the National Hurricane Center's home page, and you can see a couple of areas of interest. We have this lemon, which we had yesterday. It's 10% chance of development. There's a little tropical wave in the Bahamas, and uh, so not a big chance here, but there is some chance that this thing could develop and move inland toward Florida or up the southeast coast over the coming days. But the bigger area of interest and concern is out here in the main development region, the MDR, where we have a 40% chance of development from a tropical wave that is moving off the coast of Africa. We'll get into this and find increasingly favorable uh, an environment that's conducive for a development. So I'm going to watch this track across. Models are beginning to show this. Uh, more. Uh, we're building more of a consensus for development here, so I'm expecting that will happen. In the meantime, if you're going to the beach this weekend, pay attention to those flags on the beaches. There's still a pretty high rip current risk from Cape Cod all the way down to southern Florida, even in Puerto Rico and parts of the Gulf too. So swim at your own risk. Don't put anybody's life in jeopardy trying to rescue you. Just use good sense out there. It doesn't get any better tomorrow, really. Maybe just a slight bit, but still we've got some problems in the water. The waters are still churned up out here from Umberto and Imelda. That will settle down as we get into next week, but for now, pay attention. Here's your satellite picture, and here is Imelda here spinning around, heading off in this direction to the northeast, uh, headed right toward the tropical afterlife. We've got, uh, looks like, a frontal boundary here, convergence in the ITCZ, and of course we have our big tropical wave. This is the big daddy that's going to get into this area and develop as it moves across. So this is what we're going to be watching over the next week. Caribbean looks pretty clear. There's a little here's a little wave here in the Bahamas. Here's a wave down here in the Yucatan Peninsula. Here's another wave down here, and uh, just plenty of wave action in and around South and Central America, Venezuela, Colombia, over to Costa Rica, or, and uh, and places like that. We're looking at Belize and up to toward the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula around Cancun, seeing some showers and convection over the course of the day today. Uh, everybody else, Lesser Antilles, Greater Antilles, looking pretty good. And a little, a little thunderstorm activity here around Haiti, but other than that, looking pretty good. But we've got some things to watch out here in the tropics. I'm going to just skip the operational models and show you the ensembles since we're talking about fairly uh, far out in terms of maybe several days before we start to see some development and um, any impacts on anyone. I've rolled this ensemble suite all the way out to day seven. This is the Google DeepMind. It did very well with the last system. And as you can see, we have several of its members impacting the northern Antilles here, the Northern Lesser Antilles. This would get us into the British, British and U.S. Virgin Islands and maybe Puerto Rico out in time. And we see a little bit of um, interest in developing something here in the Bahamas. Nothing that's taking it into Florida because it takes its sweet time developing. And by that time, we've got southwesterly flow that would carry it up. But uh, you can see as we advance this along from day seven, this is 1010. Uh, we get on out here toward 1011 and 1012, October the 12th. And we start to see a kind of a shotgunning of the solutions, as you would expect as we get on it here toward day 10. Some take it, uh, cur do an early curve, and then a few others take it in toward Haiti and the DR, and everything off the East Coast goes out to sea. So the biggest signal on this ensemble suite here is for a curve away from land. What about the European ensemble? Same time, October the 10th, seven days out. Pretty good clustering here. A number of members develop something, and the operational and the GFS do too, and they both get it into the Caribbean before they both recurve. Now, what does the ensemble suite do? Well, it takes some, some of this uh, energy here in the Bahamas, develops it into a weak depression. A couple of members cross Florida, a couple of members meander around here at day seven. So let's move this on out toward uh, the next uh, time frame here, maybe day eight or so, and we're looking at many more members bringing this into the actual Caribbean as opposed to curving it quickly. This is the European ensemble. So it's 
in contrast to the Google DeepMind a little bit in that regard. Now, as we get on out here toward day 10, you can see we've got quite a bit more members moving into the Caribbean still at day 10 than we had um, from uh, the Google DeepMind. Some members curve it out to see, but we're going to have to watch this. If we start to see this thing sneak in under some of these troughs that are coming off the coast of the U.S., we could see a threat later on down the road to the U.S. So that's something to watch in terms of the overall environment out here. I've shown you the uh, rising motion map, and I'm going to put this one on today as well. This is the European Ensemble Shear Anomaly Map. Reds are greater than average shear. Blues are lower than average shear. And these are a, this is a five-day average, okay? So this is what the shear anomaly looks like over five days. And as we're looking here at days five through nine, we've got some shear out here in the Atlantic. And of course, as you get farther and farther north, you see more and more shear. But look what happens as we get on out from uh, to the next five-day increment, day of five uh, nine through 13 we're seeing less shear in our main development region in through the caribbean and especially down into the gulf and around the southeast coast so as we go on out in time shear profiles look better and better and better and more conducive for development and also this is the rising and sinking air motion map this is where we would find an environment either favorable or unfavorable here's our region that we're watching reds and oranges are unfavorable greens are favorable in terms of the background state more instability more rising motion we get on out here look at this as we get on out toward day uh, uh, four this would be tuesday october the 8th and uh, tuesday uh, thursday october the 9th and so on and so on and so on look at that greens across the board so once we get out toward about day four or so through the rest of the period we have a favorable atlantic from a background state so any tropical system developing which most of the models are starting to develop out in the mdr that would have a better chance of development uh, from a background state so several items are kind of converging together to make the uh, 10th through say the 15th towards we approach mid-october a time frame to watch for a tropical system potentially impacting uh, parts of the caribbean maybe getting close to the united states or maybe recurving into the atlantic it's too soon to tell we're going to watch it though that's what we've got in our tropical update now i'm going to show you the tropical or the uh, forecast for the weekend we'll take a look at who's going to see that snow coming in over the course of the weekend and we'll take a look upstairs and see what the sun is doing because we're still in solar storm conditions but right now i've got your weather iq question see if you know what you think you know about the weather Today's weather IQ question has to do with wind and U.S. cities. Combining those two ideas gives us the following question. What is the windiest city in the contiguous U.S., meaning we're setting Hawaii and Alaska aside, all right? Chicago, Illinois, Buffalo, New York, Amarillo, Texas, or Daytona Beach, Florida? If you know the answer or want to guess, type it in the comment section. If not, I'll have the answer for you at the end of the show. Right now, I've got your weekend weather forecast. We're gonna take a look at who's going to see that snow and cold air as we work through the weekend. Satellite imagery shows some clouds up in New England stretching back into the mid-Atlantic states. Got a couple of showers working through western Kentucky and we've been watching this disturbance in the Gulf. The models have kind of backed off on development but anytime you have convection over a warm body of water you need to watch it and we will but uh, scattered clouds here into Mississippi and Alabama are coming out of that. But the big story is that persistent southwesterly flow out here in the west clouds extending from california all the way up into montana some of those clouds are producing rain around missoula back in toward boise and east of reno and uh, west of elko so we're looking at some showers there as this trough works in it'll wind up a low pressure center and shoot that over into the northern plains for the course of the weekend bringing some snow and uh, some uh, chance of severe weather if you're sensitive to air quality or have those kinds of allergies or sensitivity be aware around milwaukee and st louis dallas southwest of austin over here in southwest oregon also and up into central washington state where we're still dealing with some wildfire smoke today look at that severe weather threat extending into parts of idaho and wyoming colorado and utah as that low begins to take shape tomorrow that extends up into the dakotas that's where the threat will be up through the central dakotas back through the panhandle of nebraska 
Alaska, and we're looking at mainly wind and hail in sort of a scattered to isolated basis. That's what we're looking at as the surface low winds up. There's just not a lot of instability to work with. Red flag warnings, though, are in effect here in South Dakota for windy conditions where it's dry, stretching into Wyoming, also into Washington State as well, looking really good out east in terms of alerts. But what are these blue things? Well, these are winter storm watches up for the mountainous areas on the border of Montana and Wyoming, even up here in northwest Montana. As that low pressure takes shape, cold air will be drawn out of Canada. Freezing levels will lower, and we're going to get a good shot of winter-like cool air in here, and we're going to pick up as much as 6 to 10 inches of snow in some of those higher peaks above five, 6,000 feet. So winter is coming. Is it going to hang around? Well, probably not for too long, but at least you'll get a taste of it here out in the mountains of the northern Rockies, folks. I'm going to break down the uh, timing of the precipitation. We're going to show this in two halves, the east and the west. Looking at rain out there this morning, as we get on in toward the evening hours, maybe 5, 6 o'clock, Pacific time, we're looking at uh, scattered showers and thunderstorms through the Rocky Mountains and off the lee of the Rockies here, but look for some of those to have some wind and hail potentially, but that low pressure will get its act together over the course of the evening and overnight hours, and you'll wake up to more showers here in uh, the northern Rockies and uh, up into the northern plains as well, and that will just continue through the course of the day. It's going to be a wet day for Wyoming and Montana and working into the Dakotas late in the evening, even North Dakota seeing some rain out ahead of that but uh, as colder air works in on the backside you start to see some blue show up that snow folks and that is coming for areas of montana and wyoming and idaho as well and severe weather is also potentially coming as we get into the overnight evening and overnight hours tomorrow in parts of the dakotas back into nebraska so keep your weather radios on and have a way to receive weather alerts in case you get a wind or a hail report not expecting tornadoes this time because we just don't have a lot of instability even though wind energy in the atmosphere is pretty robust and as we go on through the evening hours and overnight Saturday and wake up Sunday morning going to wake up to some rain and snow in Montana and some showers pulling out of the picture through the day in North Dakota and things will wind down through the course of the weekend out east we've got two kind of things that are happening we've got a big easterly flow off of the Atlantic and uh, the number the second thing is that will turn to a southeasterly flow and bring some of that rain into the southeast as we get later on into the weekend but Maine up through the Great Lakes New England all the way to the Tennessee Valley everybody looking good for a dry and sunny weekend for the most part Florida not you southern Louisiana not you and the coastal sections of the Carolinas down into Georgia certainly are going to see their fair share of shower activity push on as we work through the day on Friday, uh, today, overnight, into the overnight hours, and as we get on into Saturday, we'll see that pattern continue with the wind starting to shift. So southern Georgia into South Carolina, you could see some thunderstorms Saturday afternoon. Everybody else looking good. As we get on in towards Sunday morning, though, look what happens. We start to wake up to some showers here along the coastal sections of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, into the Gulf Coast states as well. And then those rain showers will push into Georgia and potentially southern sections of South Carolina, Alabama, and Mississippi as we go through the day on Sunday into the overnight hours. So Sunday could be a wet day, at least for part of the day down here in parts of the Deep South. And then the front will make its way on in toward the picture as we get toward the beginning of next week. And this will begin to move through the Great Lakes behind that big system that winds up and gets into Canada. Now we're going to take a look at your high and low temperatures for the next couple of days. High temperatures reflect that ongoing heat wave across much of the nation, particularly in the heartland area, folks, from the southern plains up to the northern plains in the Midwest. We're looking at high temperatures from the 90s to the 80s, all the way to the Canadian border. Much more pleasant along the East Coast, where high pressure is wedging in cooler and drier air, relatively speaking. It is still above normal for many of these areas, but it feels much nicer and cool, crisp mornings make it at least feel a little bit like fall occasionally. Temperatures not too bad out here in the West with 60 and 70s. That just warms up in the east tomorrow. High temperatures uh, in the 80s in the midsection of the country pushes to the east as that low pressure begins to take shape. A front will come through and cool things back and you can see that starting to take place out here out west and really in earnest by the time we get into Sunday for highs. Temperatures in the 50s and even 40s and 30s here in the mountains of uh, the northern Rockies and places like that warming back up out west and warmer and warmer and warmer through time as we work out in time in the east. Low temperatures looking at 
30s and 40s for overnight lows as we work into Saturday morning. It's going to feel nice and crisp out there with low dew points as well. A little bit warmer here in the nation's midsection, definitely above normal for you all. Cool out west, but that will get cooler and cooler through the weekend and will get warmer and warmer in the east through the weekend. Look at Sunday morning lows, 20s, even some teens in some of the higher peaks, folks, and 50s and 60s for pretty much everybody else until you get way down here in Florida. You guys are going to have lows in the 70s with a muggy conditions. But winter is pushing in here as that front moves east. This cool air will push east through the course of the week, but uh, it will lose a little bit of this punch as it does so, and warmer temperatures will return to much of the nation out in time. We're going to see continuation of the pattern where there's a ridge in the east and troughs working into the west over the next 10 days. So we'll see a little bit of a punch of cooler air come in behind this front that will warm up and return flow out of the south, will warm us back up. That's kind of what we're looking at at the long range. So don't get used to any cool downs. They're not gonna hang out for too long and we'll continue to remain above normal through mid-October at least. And that's your forecast. Now we're gonna wrap things up with space weather and see what's going on with this ongoing geomagnetic storm. Well, we're in day five of solar storm conditions, but we're finally getting a couple of green bars working into the KP index occasionally here. So that, I guess, is good. We've had an enhanced solar wind stream that has just been persistent. We've got this area here, this coronal hole in the bottom portion of the sun that is sending out enhanced solar wind. That should largely miss us to the south, but we could get a glancing blow from it to keep us in a minor solar storm uh, conditions. No big sunspots in terms of solar flaring activity. We haven't seen any of that. Here on the chronograph you can watch and see a little bit of a plasma discharge before we get a recalibration so that could be something that affects us a little bit. Sunspots, if we go on back up here to the this. We've got a few sunspots turning toward us. Uh, one and two that are pretty complex are turning away. You can actually see these with um, uh, intermixing of magnetic charges here that puts us at risk for more uh, of an intense solar flare. We'll watch that. The ones coming in aren't so complex yet. The aurora potential is medium I would say for this evening so pay attention if you're across the north you may catch one and finally that's it we don't really have any volcanoes or earthquakes to go over so nothing else new to talk about there as far as the moon goes we're at almost 84 percent waxing gibbous a couple of days it's going to be three days we'll have a harvest moon that's our next full moon here the first one in October it will also be a super moon so it should be extra bright maybe it will be nice and orange when it comes up over the horizon I certainly hope so that's the show, folks. That brings us into the Weather IQ question. We'll land the plane here. What is the windiest city in the contiguous U.S.? Chicago, Buffalo, Amarillo, or Daytona Beach? And the answer is Amarillo, Texas, with an average daily sustained wind of 13.6 miles per hour. I guess that's pretty good to fly a kite in, but you better hold on tight. Also pretty difficult to play golf in, I'm sure, unless you keep the ball low. One other thing that happened today in history on October the 3rd, 1990, was the German reunification. East and West Germany were formally reunified after decades of division following World War II and the Cold War. What a day that was. And that is history, folks. One thing I meant to tell you, or I wanted to tell you, somebody asked about this. We talked about the marine layer yesterday. I didn't really get into it because the question was about the foggiest city in the U.S. That's Point Reyes, California, with 200 foggy days. What happens with the marine layer is that you have a warm kind of ground. Uh, the land mass is warmer than the ocean. The ocean's very, very cool. And so you get uh, a breeze as a result of that and so warm, warm air in the land kind of goes over the marine layer it kind of comes in like this the winds off the ocean blow it in and you get rising motion over top of that with very warm uh, air uh, sitting on top of the cooler air from the marine layer that generates fog and that's why you have this sort of persistent foggy you know these foggy conditions along the west coast the waters out there are very cool and sometimes the lands warmer than that so you get, get fog generated because of that and you see that a lot in california so that's what's going on there anyway folks that's the show for today i hope you've had a good time with me i've had a good time with you as well let me know if you have any questions and uh, as always this cold rain reminding you the weather runs 24 7 but i got you covered right here right now 48 14 have a great weekend everybody we'll see you back soon